All right. So today we have Zachary Knox on the podcast. Welcome, Zach. I'm so glad you're here. I am so happy to be here. Thank you, Asha. Yeah. So Zach and I go way back. I think I met you when I was like 14 or 15. So Zach, <laughs> Zach has always been that uh, person, one of those people in my life that I've gone to to ask for advice, including for business and for law. We went to law school at the same time, used to carpool from Oakland to San Francisco um, and have, you know, sent business back and forth over the years and enjoy supporting each other. So I'm super excited to have Zach on here. And I've asked him to come because he is a business law attorney who also has an emphasis in tax law. So some of you all have been asking questions about not just what entity you need, but more specifically about, do I need a holding company? Do I need a shell company? What's the difference? And so I decided we would just get right to it. So Let's talk about that. Let's jump right in. Um, well, first, why is it important to have business entities? Well, I, I think that's a great question. And all the questions you're asking, uh, Asha, I'm, I'm sure are going to be really important for your audience. Um, the, the, there are three primary reasons that I, that I look to uh, as a rationale for creating a business entity. Uh, Chiefly among those is protecting your personal assets. So typically, if you're going to go into business and you're in business long enough, I, I like to say it's a matter of if, or, or excuse me, it's a matter of when, not if, uh, a, a claim is brought against your business. And uh, if you don't have a business entity organized that affords you limited liability protection, uh, then your personal assets are at risk. So whether you're talking about forming a corporation, whether you're talking about an LLC, in some cases there are, are LLPs, um, all of these different types of entities afford you what we call limited liability protection. It means that your personal assets are shielded from claims against the business and really your only obligation for claims against the business is whatever capital that you've already put in. So that, that's probably the chief reason. Uh, the other two reasons are uh, two, tax benefits, and three, uh, the ability to efficiently raise capital. You can imagine that if you're a, a sole proprietorship running your own business, it may be a challenge to raise a substantial amount of capital you're really asking people to put uh, money into you uh, without really a structure in place that would allow them to get any ownership in that. Um, so those are the three chief reasons that you would want to form a business. And then uh, depending on what you're actually trying to accomplish, you might get steered towards one entity or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I tell people the, the same thing. And just going back to protecting your assets, one thing that I've heard before is, well, I don't own anything yet. So, you know, I don't have anything for them to take. And I just want to challenge people to get out of that scarcity mindset, because if you're building a business, you're going to own something someday, right? And you need to have that separation between your personal assets and business assets. Also, having a business entity allows you to protect your credit. So if you can take out debt in the name of the business or open up accounts in the name of the business, and you can, then that is separate and attaches to the business and not to us. And the last thing that you said about the ability to raise capital, I work with different organizations that give seed funding and they will not invest in sole proprietors. So unless you were self-funding or plan to just get regular loans, please, please, please go get a business entity. And if I could offer just one more concept with regard to um, that mindset that you were just referring to, a lot of times, We'll hear people say, well, I don't have anything for them to take. And what they're talking about is tangible assets at that point. I don't have any money. I don't, I don't own real estate. Um, but if you're building a business, oftentimes at the start, your initial assets may be intangible, right? It may be intellectual property that you've developed. It may be ideas that you plan to execute. And if there is a claim brought against you, even if they can't collect against you today, they can collect against you in the future. So if you ever do get a job, if you happen to be unemployed, you know, trying to start your own business, 
right? Your wages at that job that you get in the future will be reachable. If you ever buy property in the future, um, that property will be reachable. And, you know, for those of us that are familiar with civil liability, if you get a judgment against you, that judgment is good for 10 years and can be renewed for additional 10 year periods. So it's, it's a whole lot easier to just protect yourself in advance uh, than suggest that you're fine going forward on your own because you don't have anything right now. That, that's not forward looking and everything about business is forward looking. Absolutely everything. And that's a really great point and a good segue into why you should be speaking to an attorney about some of these things instead of just relying on a site like LegalZoom. I've probably mentioned, given LegalZoom more nods in my podcast than I actually want to. But, you know, when you're using a, a website or uh, we were joking around and earlier talking about, you know, that that street attorney that you talk to, you know, your friend who thinks that they know what's going on, but but don't actually have the credentials. You know, how much can that set you back or hurt you when you are forming your business? If you're if you're listening to the street attorney, as as I like to call them, you know, somebody who picked up a book in the library and, and read something. And, and, I, and I don't mean to discourage that at all. Um, but the advantage of working with legal counsel, somebody who, who does this for a living is the volume of knowledge they have on the subject just can't be obtained elsewhere. I I know I, I form about a hundred businesses a year or so, give or take. I've seen people come with different ideas, different ventures. And there's a lot of nuance in this in terms of drilling down into what's right for you and what's right for your venture. Just because a certain framework worked for somebody else or you see this company is successful with this framework doesn't mean that that's the right framework for your venture. And so you need somebody knowledgeable who you can talk to about your idea, who you can flush out the concept and how you how you sort of envision it being structured and they could guide you down the right path. Um, I, I think it's interesting that you bring up a tool like LegalZoom, and I'm probably one of the few attorneys that say, I don't really have a problem with LegalZoom. Um, it's, a, it's a great tool uh, for those who know how to use it. And uh, the, 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 the comparison that I like to make is, you know, if you know how to use a power tool, for example, a, a circular saw, you can do some great things with a circular saw. Um, but if you're trying to use a power tool and you don't know how to use it, you may very well hurt yourself. And that's how I look at um, some of these business formation services. They're a great tool in terms of being able to to execute and get the documents together. But if you're not being guided through that by somebody knowledgeable, you do run the risk of setting up the wrong structure, um, putting the wrong pieces in place. And, you know, that's that's not the end of the world because you can always restructure. Um, You can go back after the fact and do it right. But it costs more money at that point. Um, And a lot of people are concerned about the cost of an attorney. And I often find myself telling them that it's less expensive to do it right the first time than to have to do it over again after you realized you spent some money and it's not going to work for you. Absolutely. Because then you're spending money twice or three times um, having someone go back in and, and not just do it from scratch, but to correct. It's always more expensive to correct something than it is to just do it right the first time. So, uh to summarize that, right, make sure that if you're using LegalZoom, you know how to use the tool properly. But I also feel like if you know what you're doing, you'd probably just go to the entity that you actually need to file with instead of going through LegalZoom. That, that's how I think about it in my mind. But get that consultation because it's not a one size fits all. There are a couple different types of entities that you can choose from. But under that, setting up your business, how it's going to run, getting the specific advice that you need for your business is worth it and will save you 
thousands of dollars in the end and give you the peace of mind that you need knowing that you're moving forward in the right direction with a team behind you that supports your vision and your dreams for your business. So we're not going to get into what's the difference between an LLC and a corporation, but I have had multiple questions about shell companies and holding companies and are they the same thing? And if I've got two different business ideas or five business ideas, can I put them under one entity and what do I do and how do I avoid taxes? So there's a lot of stuff in there. I will let you start with wherever you want to start about that, but take it away, Zach. (laughs) So that's a great question because uh, shell companies and holding companies are often organized for similar reasons, but they, they do work differently. And we can, we can dive into what the differences between the two are. But you said something that I think is very important that we often see out there in the world. Um, and it, it's sort of a, a prelude to the question of whether or not you need a shell company or a holding company. And, and, and that is just as you described, somebody has more than one idea, right? And I want to execute idea A and I want to execute idea B. Can I just put a company together and have it do everything? And, and the answer is yes, you, you could do it that way, but I'm not sure that anybody would advise you to do it that way. <laughs> right. Um, right. It, it, unless the businesses are, are related, right? If the opportunities are related, uh, then there may be some strategy behind doing that. But one of the first things I ask is, you know, what is the risk profile of this particular venture you're getting into? versus the other one that you're considering. So for example, if you want to invest in real estate, right? It has a very different cost structure, a very different capital requirement, a very different risk profile than if you want to open your food truck, right? And just like limited liability protection protects you and your personal assets, When you have more than one venture, you need to protect them from claims related to your other business activities. So that's when we start looking for a a legal separation between the two. Um, If it's sort of the same business and they're related activities, that's sort of a different thing. and, And you might be able to do that. But if they're two very different businesses, there's no reason to wed them together into one legal entity. Um, because then you're exposing one to the risk profile of the other. And so oftentimes we would advise you that you separate them. And I think that leads us to the question of, well, how do you structure your ownership then? And should it be a holding company? What is a shell company? And and, and how does all that work? And so um, I I think the the difference, and and this is the primary difference between the two, A shell company holds assets, right? And those assets might be um, utilized by other companies. So that sort of gives you the umbrella concept. In a shell context, uh, your shell company might own real estate over in this area. It might own equipment in another area. It might just be holding liquid capital Um, to be put to use with other businesses. And so that real estate may be used by another business. Um, The equipment might be leased to some other business and the shell company's holding all of it. Um, A holding company, on the other hand, literally holds equity ownership interests in other companies. Right. They don't necessarily hold the assets the way a shell company does, but it would hold stock in another company. So oftentimes we think of a holding company as a parent company uh, that owns equity in these subsidiary companies underneath it. So that's the classic parent subsidiary company concept. Um, And those subsidiaries could be wholly owned by the holding company or they could be partially owned by the holding company. Now, the similarity between the two is that neither a shell company or a holding company has any active operations itself. 
tend to have zero employees, zero activity. It's just holding things. Um, but the shell company is typically holding assets while a holding company is holding equity interests in other companies. Got it. So, okay. So then why would someone choose to have a holding company to hold the assets instead of just being, you know, Asha Wilkerson, equity owner in company A, company B, and company C? Yeah. So oftentimes it's beyond just your ownership um, as a justification for that holding company. It may be part of your capital raising strategy, right? So if there is a holding company, and let's say that holding company has two wholly owned subsidiaries, right? You as the owner of the holding company could insert yourself at each level, right? And you could raise capital at the individual operating level with those subsidiaries. Um, but let's say those subsidiaries are conducting related business, right? You may want to organize a holding company so that depending on what investor you're potentially talking to, you can make different sorts of offers. Maybe investor is only interested in activity A, and then you can raise capital with that investor in the subsidiary that's conducting activity A. But maybe there's another investor that's interested in everything that you're doing and is willing to put up more money. And so at, for that investor, you might raise capital at the holding company level, and then they get participation and everything underneath that. Um, so that's, that, that's probably the main reason for removing yourself and having your ownership in a holding company. Um, the other thing is to keep a clean cap table, right? So if you have a bunch of partners that you're working with on a business, um, it can get a little messy when you're into those capital raising conversations and you already have seven, 10 people sitting on your cap table, right? If those founders were to consolidate themselves in a holding company and then they go out and try to raise capital at the subsidiary level, there's only one entity sitting on that cap table. It makes for a much cleaner cap table when you're trying to present to investors and they can see where, where their participation will come in at and they can rationalize how they're going to get their money back out when they need to. It's a lot harder to answer that question uh, when you have you know, a full cap table. Right. Absolutely. So if you are lost in the sauce right now about all of this language in holding companies, shell companies, subsidiaries, cap tables, do not worry. Listen to this podcast episode again and then reach out to Zach because he can walk you through it with expertise and, uh, you know, do it in a way that you will feel supported and comfortable and know exactly what the next move is. And that's why it's also really important to build out your team of people who can support you in this. Um, because it's not, it's not for beginners. And I would also encourage people <laughs> that if you have an idea, like take your idea to your business advisor, take your idea to your attorney and tell them what you want to have happen. And then they can advise you of what's the best way to do it. You don't have to start with what is the entity, or I need to have this holding company. Let me see how it fits. Like talk to the expert about what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And then they will tell you what's the best way to go about it. You don't have to know everything. You just have to know somebody who knows what to do, right? Well, let, let me add one piece to that, uh, Asha. If, uh -huh. if you're talking to your legal counsel about your idea, you're already going to have the benefit of confidentiality, right? But there are other business advisors that you may want to talk to, other people you want to share your idea with. Please, please, please make it a habit to have those people sign off on what we call a non-disclosure agreement, an NDA, before you go sharing any critical information about your idea or your business. Um, I'm sure, Asha, you may talk about this issue on your podcast at some point if you haven't already. Um, but as attorneys, you and I have a legal obligation uh, to maintain the confidence of the, of the people that we talk to other business advisors, investors, uh, 
they don't have those same obligations. And so you do need to protect yourself that way as well. Right. Very, very true. Very true. So let's jump into the realm of taxes. We're just going deep today. So I often send you or have on occasion sent you people um, who need a little bit of help with their taxes. So can you explain what it is, what your role is? Because you're not a CPA, but you are an attorney that has a background in tax and has practiced in some tax areas. So what are the things that you do when you're advising or helping people fix their uh, business tax issues? Yeah, so uh, oftentimes uh, I'm licensed to practice in the U.S. tax court, and I got my start in the legal industry working with a firm that specialized in criminal tax defense. Mm, um, criminal so, tax defense is a big deal, y'all. Let's not <laughs> get it right yeah. the first time. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so, I mean, obviously these were unique situations where um, companies uh, went through an audit didn't like the outcome of the audit and appealed to the U.S. tax court, or even in some cases were referred to DOJ for criminal tax evasion, and we would defend them there. Um, primarily, my role in, in the tax practice is to represent taxpayers in those audits, uh, in those appeals hearings, and in any sort of referral uh, for criminal prosecution for tax evasion. Um, I could do tax preparation as well, akin to what CPAs do, but I tell folks, if you're paying an attorney to do your tax prep, you're probably overpaying. Right. Um, <laughs> so look, oftentimes, uh, folks get into trouble with taxes largely because, they're either A, not doing a good job of record keeping, or B, they're not paying a professional to help them and their tax situation is complicated. Um, you know, the, the scenario could be as germane as I'm a professional salesperson and I was trying to write off the dry cleaning of my suits as a business expense because I wear the suits for business and they need to be clean. Otherwise I'm gonna look sloppy and I need to look good to make sales. It, it seems like it would make sense, but it's not allowed. And for the person who is doing the taxes on their own, those sorts of mistakes is what could trigger an audit, right? And so I, I tell people when it comes to taxation, it's, it's better to err on the side of avoiding <laughs> having to, to deal with the, uh, the tax authorities rather than to try to stretch deductions or stretch write-offs uh, that wouldn't otherwise be appropriate. Um, and so th that's the vast majority of audits. It's you know simple mistakes, it's sloppy record keeping, it's, it's the refusal to, per, to go to a professional to get help, particularly if you have a complicated situation. You know, very rarely do we run into situations where, you know, it's going to result in a criminal referral. I don't want to scare anybody <laughs> listening to your, to your podcast. That is really not common. Um, but it, but it, is, it is possible, right? And so, you know, my advice to folks would be be diligent in your record keeping. Keep your receipts. Um, and even if you prepare your taxes yourself, which I'm not discouraging people from doing, have a professional review them before you file them, right? And that, that's, that's my best advice to try to avoid um, collection action from the different tax authorities. And, and, I, and I'll say one, one other thing about the tax authorities. Um, for those of you who are listening to the podcast and you live here in California, it is a lot more difficult um, to deal with the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, or even worse, the EDD, the Employment Development Department, <laughs> right. than, it, than it is the IRS. Uh, people often think the IRS is the boogeyman. They're often easier to work with uh, than some of the state agencies. So, you know, bear, bear that in mind, because if you have a, a, a tax issue at the federal level, chances are you also have a tax issue at the state level. Um, you sometimes there may be, you know, uh, uh, 
an amount of time will pass before the state catches up with the federal action. But by then, you know, penalties can accrue, interest will be accruing. And so it's, it's, it behooves of everyone to try to get it done right the first time. So similar as to what we were talking about in terms of forming your company, do it right the first time and you will save yourself a mountain of headache later. So one other thing about uh, hiring a professional to form your business and to and to do your ta- prepare your tax return is that we as licensed professionals have to act with a certain level of professionalism. We have to meet the industry standard. And if we mess up, you are protected from our mistakes, right? We have to cover that for you. So I know plenty of people, you know, and it's not so much on the bookkeeping side, the regular, you know, monthly tallying of what's going on in your business, but on the tax returns, you want to hire someone who's going to give you some kind of protection if they have messed up on your tax returns, as opposed to taking a stab at it yourself. It is different than doing your personal taxes. And I know you've probably been doing your personal taxes for your entire life, your entire tax filing life, but this is a little bit different. So definitely spend the time, find somebody who knows your business and can help you. And the other thing I would suggest, oh, go ahead, Zach. Well, I was going to say generally any tax preparer you work with is, is guaranteeing their work. The one caveat about that is that they are legally allowed to rely on the information that you provide them. So you have to give them accurate information. You have to give them full and honest information. Otherwise, you may not be protected. So there there is a rationale, as Asha said, to, to, to work with a professional. They do guarantee their work, but it's only to the extent that you provide them adequate information. Yes, that's that's an excellent point. Like they don't cover they don't cover your bad record keeping, right? They only cover the mistakes that they could actually be responsible for. So you take give the them the financial right. reports and they produce the tax returns. If those reports mm-hmm. are wrong, they're not going to take responsibility for that. Right, right. And also, you know, we talked about jokingly about the criminal court, you know, in, in criminal Uh, prosecution for tax evasion is a long way off for most people. But I will tell you to, and that's, that's like that scary thing, right? That people want to avoid. Um, Paying taxes doesn't have to be scary. It also is necessary in the society that we live in. And I know people complain about paying too many taxes or too high a tax. In the Netherlands, the tax is like 45%. Granted, they have a lot more social services, you know, and so the, the people get it back. But this is how we survive in this, that's how your roads get paved in, in your, in your neighborhood, right? Um, in front of your house on your way to work. I, I, I I tell people, if you're paying taxes, you have high class problems. Yeah. Right. You got people with money problems. Yeah. 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 You're you're only paying, you're only paying taxes if you make money. If you, if you're not making money, you're not paying taxes. So that can be a measuring stick for success. If you owe quite a bit in taxes, well, I mean, you could, seriously have messed up, but you're either seriously (laughs) messed up or you're doing really well. (laughs) Right, right, right. right. We're going to focus on the doing really well. But I also want to caution people because I know a lot of folks, you know, scared to hire an attorney, scared to do the CPA, you know, scared to pay taxes. Let me tell you, if you plan on buying a house or some property and you need to go and get a loan from the bank and you have reported zero income or really low income on your taxes, you're not a good risk for the bank because your tax returns look like you can't afford it. So even if you were bringing in all this revenue, you still have to show what is coming to you because if you want to play that zero game, you will be zero for a long time. So don't just <laughs> don't just think about, you know, what is happening right now, but look, you know, five, 10 years into the future, where do you want to be and put those practices into place now in your business that are going to get you and support you in that position that you want to be in, in the future. Uh, let me add a couple thoughts to that. Cause I think that's a very important conversation. Asha, if you are self-employed, it is going to be much more challenging for you to obtain mortgage financing, period. That's just how it works. Um, and so if you think about obtaining a mortgage, right, there's the three pillars that you need to, to address when obtaining your mortgage, your credit score, your down payment, 
and your ability to make the monthly installment payment. Um, we're talking about income at that point, right? And so you could have great credit, but if you can't demonstrate the income coming in necessary to make those monthly payments, nobody's going to lend to you. And even nowadays, if you have a substantial uh, down payment that you intend to use, they're going to scrutinize where that down payment came from. So, it, you know, if if you are squirreling money away and <laughs> you're showing zero income on your taxes and then you come with this huge down payment, um, a mortgage lender is going to drill into where this money come from. Right. <laughs> right. And so, you know, unless unless you squirreled away enough to go all cash in, this is this is going to be a problem. And again, it's if you're self-employed, Asha, it's going to go back to your record keeping as well. Um, so, you know, not just for taxes, but for, uh, you know, personal matters like buying real estate. It's going to be important if you're self-employed that your records are pristine and that the underwriter can follow where the money is coming from. Otherwise, they're going to deny you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So these are the bigger picture things that I like to remind people of, you know, that that it's it's not just at that small level of, oh, I got this idea, but I don't want to spend the money. But I'm assuming that the reason why you're starting a business is because you want some freedom, financial freedom, probably want some time freedom. You probably want to leave a legacy financially for your kids, for your kids, 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 you know, maybe leave your impact in the community. So and there isn't a shortcut for that. There are advantages that you can take of the tax code that you, I would advise you to get a professional to tell you exactly what those advantages are and how to take them. But there isn't, in my experience, a shortcut for doing the work the right way. You just got to have those people around you that can help you do it so you can reach all the success that you are looking for. Success requires paying dues, right? There's, you know. If, if, if you want to go win the lottery, buy a lottery ticket, you'll have your one in 10 million chance. OK, but the sure path to success is laying the groundwork and paying your dues. And, you know, one, one of the things that I often run into when people approach me with their business idea, they have trouble letting go of their day job. OK, I got a day job and I, and I, and I totally understand we all need an income. We have families to support, kids to take care of. Um, but you have to ask yourself at some point, how much confidence do I have in my idea? Because if you're going, if your idea is really going to be successful, you can't treat it as a weekend hobby. You have to own it. You have to live it and breathe it. This is something that you have to do every day. And that may come through a transition. You may have to transition from what you're doing now, get your business going, and then and then roll over into it. Um, but that is something that every entrepreneur who's coming from an employment world has to wrestle with. And for those of you listening in who are uh, sold on becoming that entrepreneur, then you have to realize that this decision is coming. And you have to plan for it, not only plan for it in your business, but also plan for it in your personal life, because it is going to have impacts on your personal life. Yeah, I think that's that's excellent advice. And I think that's probably a really good place to wrap it up. Right. No shortcuts. Plan for it. You got to pay your dues, build your team that's going to support you. Define your own success. But no, it's going to it's going to require some sacrifice to get there. And that's that's not a bad thing. Is there anything else you want to add? No, I'm just uh, thankful for the opportunity to be here. Hope we can do something like this again. And uh, I hope your listeners found this to be informative. Yeah, and absolutely. Not, and not so. too wonky. The tax stuff can get wonky, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it can, but that's why we're doing it in little uh, snippets. So if they want to reach out to you and either use your legal services or get your tax and business advice, how should they contact you? Uh, you can reach us online at knoxrosslaw.com. Uh, you can follow me at 
Instagram, Zach underscore Esquire, Z-A-K underscore E-S-Q. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. Great. Thank you, Zach. Thank you.